here. And before we start with a quote unquote lecture series, uh, just want to share my background a little bit for those that have not interacted with me in the chat. Uh, so I have a bachelor's degree in chemistry. I have a master in nanotech with emphasis on nanomaterials. And I'm currently doing a PhD in material science. Um, don't take this for granted that everything I say is true. There's plenty of people with titles that say things that are patently not true. Uh, yes, I am old. But uh, generally speaking, that is my formation and that is where I come from uh, to attack problems, surface a material scientist and a chemist, more material chemist than anything. Uh, let me be clear, biomaterials is heavily multidisciplinary field. I will not, not have all the answers. Just, just giving you the heads up. But you have my undying commitment that if I don't know something and the answer is out there, I will find it for you, okay? Uh, so if you straight up give me a question, I don't know, I will be like, all right, I don't know, but I will get back to you, okay? That is my commitment to everyone here who takes the time to attend to this lecture. All right, moving on. So the lecture series objective, not just this lecture, but the general objective of the series is uh, to make an attractive entry point for the newbies. Uh, that are interested in this interaction between material, material science and biology. Um, specifically for the biologists, I want to enrich your perspective so that you can be more inspired to interact with the field of material science. And for myself, I really just want to research more and talk about things that deeply fascinate me, right? So this is a win, win, win for everyone. Awesome. So let's get started with the first lecture. Um, just an overview. This is going to be quick. This is going to be introductory. We're not going to go into the weeds just yet. First of all, we're going to have a, a small boosting the ego of you biologists and why biological systems are so special. Uh, then we're going to talk about the definition of biomaterials, their properties, a bit of history, uh, the sources where we get said biomaterials, and a biocompatibility, just a very small primer because that subject by itself is probably two graduate courses, maybe three, but we're going to try to keep it brief for the purposes of this presentation. So let's talk about engineer systems versus biological systems. Um, on the left, you have the Atlas is uh, the most advanced humanoid uh, robot that exists. Very powerful, very impressive uh, machine. And the other side you have Roy Jones Jr., the best boxer in all time. Um, and I wanna talk about what makes Roy Jones such a special, <laughs> God damn it, make you. Uh, I mean, you would think he's a robot by the way he boxes, incredible. But I want you to think about why are they different and, and why biological systems are so incredibly special. And I have this very simple uh, yet deep slide about robust systems versus resilient systems. When we engineer things, when we make planes, when we make robots, when we make all this incredible machinery that you see all the time, um, we make them to be robust. We want them to taking perturbations from the environment and not be affected. We want them to stay the same. I make a plane, I want it to keep flying. I don't want it to fly better, I just want it to fly. What makes resilient systems, especially biological systems, is that they benefit from certain level of perturbations. So think of it this way. Um, if I get a hand prosthesis, let's say I take off my hand or I lose my hand and I, and I get a bion, uh, you know, um, a prosthesis that it's mechanical, robotic, and it's going to be more powerful than my hand. But that prosthesis will never become stronger than it is the day they put it on me. Never. It's just going to, if I keep it maintained, it's going to stay as strong as before. Biological systems, specifically arms in this case, become stronger the more you use them, as long as a given perturbation doesn't outright break them. But that is super special and we have achieved very 
little amount of materials who improve with use. That is what makes biological systems so fascinating, that a biological system improves with use. A certain degree of perturbations of noise is good. Uh, okay, we're good. Uh, again, when we engineer systems, planes, etc., etc., those are robust, but they do not improve with you. So a plane does not become better the more you fly. It just stays as good if you give it maintenance. Okay, so that is just a boost of why we're so interested as engineers in biological systems. They, they do something magical that we have, we find very, very hard uh, to replicate. Adaptive is good. Okay, uh, I'm going to take the question straight up to try the dynamic. When it comes to a difference in, in that there is no resilient systems, a key difference is that there is no energy input into our materials versus biological systems. Um, okay, so first of all, there is input into our robust regular mechanical systems, which is a, a person goes and does maintenance, right? Versus cells do maintenance, but there will always be a, a need for maintenance. Um, and what are we doing to change that? There is some degree of, um, it's not the same, I call hard labor. Um, we're trying to get to a point where, for example, carbon nanotubes is going to cause buildup, et cetera, et cetera. And there's definitely a good point there. All right, this is actually a good philosophical question, and I'm going to go into a tangent. So we're going to hold that one for the end, but we will address it, and it's a very good question. Um, this is just to give you a boost on the ego for biologists, why we should study the systems. We'll go back to the question and go into this rabbit hole later. So let's put a, a clip note there and go on into talking about the definition of biometry. We're going to make an exercise. I want everyone here, well, not everyone here, to try to write a definition to a biomaterial right now. Just write what comes to your mind that defines a biomaterial. I'm reading you here. So let's just take some time to do that. Everything that has cells. Yeah, frogs. Oof. Anything that has cells in DNA. Yeah, you have your points, frogs. You, you won. It helps with biological processes, material of biological origin. That is an interesting answer. Material for synthetic stuff from biological origin. Interesting. Well done, A and S, or should I say OMS? Uh, Biocompatible materials for synthetic origin. Uh, material that is for biologists. Materials that are able to interact with biological... Okay, it's my other phase. It's my other phase is, 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 is doing some good stuff. Um, well done, well done. I'm impressed. All right, so I guess we have to stop at some point. So we got the answers. Those were good definitions. But it turns out that the definition of biomaterial is actually uh, very narrow. It, it necessitates... Two, uh, two applications, basically. Um, the definition of biomaterial by the European Society of Biomaterials, they sort of had a very big conference in 2005, and they tried to come up with this pointed, straight up, this is the definition, everything else is outside. It's a material intended to interface with biological systems to evaluate, treat, augment, or replace any tissue, organ, or function in the body. Uh, so there's this very important thing. Many of you define a biologically derived material, which is another incredible field that we'll have lectures on. I promise you, I love that field. But biomaterials are intended to be put on a body and either evaluate, treat, augment, or replace uh, a given tissue, be it hard or soft, you know, or a whole organ, or just add function to the body. And what I really like about this one is um, the term augment. So if you're going to get extra facilities, that is also super interesting to me, at least. 
Now, if you see, there's another definition I found. This is going to be one of our textbooks for the lecture series. Uh, it's Hatchery uh, Fundamentals of Biomaterials. If I serve any plastic into my knee for medical reason, it becomes a material. Um, okay. Strictly speaking, because it was not intended to interface with a biological system, you could, you could argue that no, it isn't. But as we will see medical, like uh, in the history of biomaterials, what you just described has happened plenty of times. And there is a certain argument that depends on the steel. Stainless steel is a biomaterial, like quote unquote biomaterial. But regular steel, no. And to be fair, stainless steel is still problematic. And we'll discuss that just in a little bit. So hold on. But you have a great point there. Uh, so, in this other textbook that I hope you guys acquire through completely legitimate means, biomaterials are substances implanted within or used in the conjunction with the body designed to have properties closely matching that of a biological system, be stable enough for aim the aimed use, have appropriate levels of bioactivity, and are designed to partially or completely fulfill the functions of disease, damage, or malfunctioning tissues or organs. Um, Definitely. Very interesting. Very fascinating. Uh, this is a more wordy definition. Living biology. That's, that's special. Um, I like this one, but I do not like that it misses the augment part, part, right? It's not only about imitating what is, but trying to unlock what it, what it could be, right? To try to improve uh, biological function. That is also an interesting application of biomaterials. And biomaterials, generally speaking, have a certain set of desirable properties, right? Uh, and I number them in, in order of, quote unquote, desirability. First of all, be biocompatible. As, as Snap pointed out, steel. So is steel biocompatible? Regular steel? Hell no. Uh, it will cause a lot of problems, infections, etc., etc., right? So it has to be non-toxic, non-carcinogenic, and non-allergenic, right? Um, what about donated? Okay, organs, since they're tissue, I don't think they would count as materials per se. Um, but it's a good question. I appreciate it a lot. Uh, two, have physical properties um, comparable to those in the tissue that it replaces. Uh, they have to have appropriate mechanical properties. So, for example, imagine I put you know, some cheapo plastic in your knee and it falls apart. <laughs> Thanks. Well done, Nav. I love you, bro. So we also have appropriate serviceable life. So let's say I have a, a great uh, prosthesis, like, or a, a hip implant. And it's going to be phenomenal for a year. That is not good, right? Because humans, desirably, live for more than a year. We want it to have an appropriate lifespan because all surgical procedures need to be taken seriously as there's risks, right? So we want them to have appropriate lifespans. Uh, we also have, want them to have chemical properties similar to that of the tissues they're replacing, you know, hydrophilicity, hydrophobicity, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we need them to be processable and sterilizable without difficulty. Again, this, is, this part, it's more desirable, quote unquote. You're gonna have a ton of biomaterials that are very difficult to achieve all this, but we still use them because they're just that good. Uh, it must have appropriate bioactivity. By that, I mean, it's not that sometimes you don't want completely inert things. You want them to have the right amount of bioactivity. And the eighth, which is always nice, but it's not always possible. We want it to be economical and available. Makes sense, right? So now we're going to go into story time. Um, specifically, we're going to talk about how even before the field of biomaterials was developed about 50 years ago, uh, we've, humanity has been using quote unquote biomaterials. So uh, glass eyes, metal noses, ivory teeth, those have all been found in Egyptian mummies. The man, the myth, the legend, Hippocrates himself, use gold wires and sutures. 
And that is so cool. Like, that to me, I was so impressed because Gold is very nerd. Like, damn, they figured it out. That I'm so impressed of that, man. Um, and that over there is a, a Mexica corpse of a lady that died about 40 years of age. And she had mental, de uh, mental, uh, dental a fixed jade, I think it's jade or, or some type of precious stone. But this was found in a dig about 20 years ago. So we've been doing, quote unquote, biomaterial uh, research, let's say empirical research. Uh, oh, <laughs> time wasted, realized that I made a shout out to him and his trivia, phenomenal trivia. Very glad you did. So for example, stents, they were developed in the 1850s. When a dentist, actually, dentists are the heroes of biomaterials. Let me just say it. They're the guys who test the things we use later down in the rest of the body for obvious reasons, right? Uh, the mouth is ready available. It's a good test place. Uh, but yeah, we've had been doing biomaterials for a long time, but just not with scientific rigor. Another very cool uh, history bit of biomaterials. Um, is by the best chat ever. Oh God! It's like, no, 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 no. Um, no, no. Um, prof this is uh, Professor Williams, really. Yeah, almost forgot. So he was a doctor for the British medical uh, military medical service in World War Two. Uh, back then, uh, in the sort of like chamber where pilots were on the bombers, they started using polymethyl metacrylate, PMMA, or as it was known, Persplex, uh, to shield the layer um, uh, of, the, of the glass dome where pilots are. Now, this is actually very clever and very important. I'll, I'll make a parenthesis there. When you see glass in a car, in a plane, etc., etc. It is actually a composite of a glass and a, mostly a, a plastic, your polymer. Why? Because if it was just glass and it was smashed and it was broken, it would actually just shatter apart, just explode. And imagine if you're fly, flying a plane and an enemy pilot smashes your, your window, well, you're dead, you're, you're gone. Um, so what they do is put a polymer, then put the, the glass, and the polymer holds the glass in place even if it breaks, right? That's actually a very clever way, and you see it in car accidents, right? When you see the, the windows cracked, but they don't actually break. The reason they don't break is that it's actually a polymer glass composite. And that is what they were already using in World War II, but in planes. Um, what happened here is because of the heavy situation that combat plates are on, um, pilots will get injuries from uh, PMMA shards that will go into their eyes. And when Professor really realized that there were bits of metacrylate, of polymetacrylate, that were not infected in the eyes of, of the pilots, he got an idea, like, most things that go into the eye cause an infection, inflammation, etc., etc. Well, PMMA did nothing. Like, it just embedded there, but it did not produce an immune response. And he, that he stuck with that idea. And about three to four years later, depends on the story you read, he came up with the idea of using uh, PMMA, PMMA to develop the first intraocular, intraocular lens implants to treat cataracts. So I want you to think about it. This is all just a discovery. There was no scientific forethought of how we did this. It's just a doctor that realized that certain polymers did not uh, produce uh, an immune response. Polymethyl metacrylate, that is the correct one. Sorry for the pronunciation error. Um, so that's a cool story. Never say that terrible things don't come out with uh, silver linings, I guess. And 
I made this big, big uh, biomaterials table. Actually, I didn't. Uh, I snapped it from the textbook. But it generally just gives you an idea of how we've been using question. Okay, let's listen to a question. No, drugs are not uh, biomaterials. Uh, specifically, you have biomaterials that release drugs, but they're not the drugs themselves. Okay, so it, it does make a very different statement. Acrylics, oh, acrylics were probably, the plastic revolution was in the 30s and 40s. So it's between those 20 years, like 30s and 40s, yeah, early 30s. Um, definitely. So no, drugs do not count as um, biomaterials. You have no one microbiomaterials, the 1930s, okay, 1930s. <laughs> Math, don't troll people. I mean, I know you're going to do it. <laughs> okay, I, I cannot keep looking at that where I'm going to laugh out loud. Okay, so this is a table. We can see just the, how the progress has been coming in and in. Um, and we have individual inventors behind some very big leaps, such as hemodialysis. You have uh, cough. You have polymers with appropriate mechanical properties for hip prothesis. That's uh, Judith and Judith. Vascular graphs with textile materials. Boris, Duretta, and Blackmore. Like, this is being a field with a lot of great work going into. And if anyone wants to research into this story, uh, I'll be more than glad to expand on it. But we've had enough trivia for now. Let's move on into more like discussing Broadly, where biomaterials are used. This image comes for a very classic review that, for those bio bio inclined, I would heavily recommend you read it. It's it's an all time classic that basically lists all the commercial um, biomaterials currently being used right now. We have our lady here, and we can see all the types of fun biomaterials that we that we get to see in actual praxis from dental implants and what kind of stuff we get, uh, dental bridges, vascular grafts, intermediary nails. Nails are a big thing. Like we use nails all the time to fixate bones together. Uh, tendon ligament replacements, cartilage replacements, bone plates. Like you think of it, we've done it. We had mixed results, but we've done it. And I will let you review this image in your own time. There are moment to tell people why. Okay. Oh, well, all right. We'll we'll do that. Nav will tell it on his free time. And let's talk about the types of biomaterials, uh, because the application depends on the type of biomaterial. And we have four broad categories. Um, we have metals, ceramics, synthetic polymers, and um, natural biopolymers. I chose coconut crab because we were discussing about coconut crabs, but chitin and chitosan are, well, actually the biological is, chitos, uh, is chitosan, and it's very used in, in different applications of biomaterials. And from this sort of like four broad categories, we derive a fifth category, which is the composite one. So you can grab two categories and sort of bind them together. Uh, and they all have their plus and cons, and they have the classic example, right? So biopolymers, you have collagen, hyaluronic acid, shout out to frogs, chitosan, silk, alginate. And the advantage is, woo, well, it's cheap and it's abundant. The problem is that biopolymers are degradable by, uh, you know, the body relatively easy. They tend to produce strong immune responses. Uh, and if you want to process them, you know, sort of machine them with high temperature uh, equipment, it's not possible because they degrade. The application, they're mostly used for tissue engineering, ground dressing, you know, silk uh, sutures and whatnot, and artificial skin. For example, I saw a case where fish scales were being used as sort of an coverall skin for burns, yeah, Festus right there with the, with the knowledge. Synthetic polymers, you know how we discussed uh, polymethyl metacrylate, PMMA. 
uh, Teflon, polyolactide, nylon, PDMS, PDFE, great stuff. Uh, advantages, okay, I, I said degradable, but here's a trick. They're degradable when you want them to, right? So you can sort of like play with their degradation, unlike with biopolymers. They don't have corrosion problems, and they're rather malleable. The problem is that, okay, they're still degradable, so they might degrade and release monomers that are toxic into the body. They have a low relative strength and low resistance to impact and wear. Exactly, you know, it's, it's the thing, it's a middle ground, right? It's useful on the one side and not useful on the other. That's beautiful. Uh, they're often used for soft tissue implants and drug delivery systems. That you, you can ask Kraken all about drug delivery systems. I'll leave that to her. She's the pro over there. Uh, metals. Remember I said stainless steel? Regular steel is going to do more damage than good. Okay, uh, let's, let me finish the chart and then I'll go back to Nap's question. So stainless steel, tit titanium, cobalt, chromium alloys, those are sort of the classic uh, metals that are biocompatible, quote-unquote. They, they have high tensile and compressive strength, and they have stellar resistance to wear and impact. Disadvantages. Corrosive. <laughs> uh, oh, boy. Yeah, that's some bad stuff. Like, the, the fact that metals corrode, that's a big B against them. They have very high density, much, high dens much higher density than bone, so that can also be a bit problematic. But they're still used for bone plates, screws, pins, staples, and uh, joint. Uh, they're sort of like used for joint replacements. Uh, composites. So composites are all about mix and matching either metal with ceramics, metals with polymers, or polymers with ceramics. And they have, quote unquote, mixed properties. They're trying to achieve. <laughs> okay, metals don't always corrode, but on biological environments, the highly oxidative environment that is produced by the immune response, most metals, even gold, will corrode eventually. Um, what happens is that some metals passivate, passivate, and the passivation protects them from the very corrosive environment, right? Um, but yeah, we'll go into that stuff later. So again, mixed properties, you get what you get. Marissa, please stop. Um, the mixed properties are definitely something great. You can have sort of like high tensile strength, but lower density. You can sort of try to mix and match different things. But not only do you get the best of both worlds, you sometimes get the worst of both worlds. That is why I said that disadvantages are very composite dependent. But they still have um, applications, hip implants, carbon fiber reinforced ligaments, tendons, screws, pins, and plates. There are commercially available composite materials already in the market. <laughs> that was redundant. Derp. Okay. So, um, okay, I wanted to go back to the question. Question, question. So, Nav asked, you mentioned combining these categories. Would modification of these biopolymers render them more biocompatible? For example, we can nitrate cellulose and make it sticky tape. In a similar manner, one could use particular chemistry to modify chitin. I ask because I assume that the chemical, physical, and probably the mechanical properties, as well as the degradation, would be great with biomaterials. However, when modify, one could potentially fix this. That is absolutely correct, and we already do. Um, surface modification is super big in biomaterial um, science, right? So we rarely use polymers. Pegylation, for example, it's, it's a classic. Uh, pegylation, what time mentioned it, pegylation is a stealth strategy. Uh, the immune system does not really recognize uh, polyethylene glycol. Maybe, maybe, but uh, as I was saying, the immune system does not recognize polyethylene glycol as something to be degraded, right? So one of the strategies we use to protect uh, the structures we put into the body is uh, pegylation, right? That is what time is referring to. 
material speaking, uh, yes, surface modification is a huge part of biomaterials. Um, and, and not only to protect them from corrosion, but in the case of sensors, you modify it to put the antibodies on it, right? Or other types of refiner, refined sensors. So, yeah, surface modification, huge field. We will talk about this, but it's much more advanced, right? We need to go through basic chemistry first before we go into that particular side of things. Okay, so we talk about the sources, we talk about pulling things. Now there's a big but, Oof, a big, big uh, problem with that sort of outlines why biomaterials is such a challenging field. And it's called the foreign body immune response. Basically, the body is a complex system that does not like foreign interference. When you put something the body does not recognize into it, it has two strategies. I will either destroy it, just bring out the most corrosive chemical environment I can. I will just put superoxide radicals, just go really burn that stuff. And if after doing that, I cannot eliminate the foreign object, I will isolate the foreign object. So I will make a cocoon around it. Um, and I would just pretend it doesn't exist. Just isolate and put away. So these are the two broad strategies of the immune system when you introduce a foreign object to it. So we have a huge challenge uh, that this will be a lecture on its own. I'm very terrified. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not going to lie. This is a lecture of its own. It will be. It will be the third lecture I already have planned it. Um, but the foreign body immune response it's a field of its own. I will do my best to cover it as best as I can. But I can already see the immunobiologists being like, you dare to come here into the hallowed ground of the gods. And me, an engineer, be like, yes, I want to do materials engineering. And then you would just whoosh, splat me into the ground because it is a very complicated field. Very fun stuff. Um, this is just a caricature, but <laughs> sorry, ANS. Uh, definitely, we're going to have fun looking at this. This is just a caricature. Basically, you get uh, recognition and inflammation. Protein absorbs into the material sort of to market. Macrophages get absorbed and they try to eat away the material. If they cannot absorb it, they go Boltron. They combine and sort of make this capsule that then foments uh, sort of like fibrotic growth around the, the foreign body, right? So this is a very wide category. We will have a talk just in this. Um, and to ensure biocompatibility, we have woo, like an incredible amount of tests a biomaterial must go through before you could even dare to put it into a, into a person, right? So we have animal welfare requirements, we have uh, genotoxicity, carcinogenicity, and reproductive toxicity. We have selection tests for interactions with blood. We have tests for uh, in vitro cytotoxicity, tests for local effects after implantation. We have ethylene oxide sterilization residuals, and the list goes on and on and on. So just to remind you, this field is a medical field. And that means that you have to be very careful with what you put into the body, else you will have very adverse results uh, in the patients. As Nav mentioned, steel. Like There were times where people tried to make steel uh, prosthetics and put them into the body, like you know, bone replaces and whatnot, and they rusted and hurt people. Uh, so, <laughs> We've made some mistakes. Let's let's be real here, like as material scientists. And definitely now we have a whole infrastructure dedicated so that we don't put things that hurt people on them. I'm gonna punch you now. I'm gonna go all the way to Switzerland. I'm gonna punch you for that. Okay. So I think this is uh, enough coverage of the basics. Uh, let's recap a little bit. So, as we said, biological systems and their materials have unique and highly desirable properties. 
towards studying and imitating for engineers. Biomaterials are for diagnostics, therapy, and alimentation. The field might be 50 years old, but biomaterials have existed for much, much longer time. Yeah, Anz, thank you for staying. Love you, man. Bye-bye. Um, there are no perfect biomaterials. There will always be pros and cons. Engineering things is hard. Uh, and finally, just remember for now, the foreign body immune response is a massive engineering challenge that requires work of both biomaterial engineers and immuno, uh, immune specialized, you know, biologists, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So for the next lecture, we will go in depth into the actual chemistry of materials, all right? And we're going to swap, swap a little bit um, from textbook, right? So we had the prior textbook, which is Fundamentals of Biomaterials. This will be Callister's Materials uh, Science and Engineering. So we're going to go into the weeds. I know you biologists are not a fan of chemistry, but I'm going to try to make it as simple as possible. But we're going to have to go into the chemistry to really understand how things work. So, I, so I'm going to need you to trust me. If you want to get a head start, uh, please check out this specific book, Phenomenal Stuff. It's my favorite uh, textbook on material science. And uh, I think with that, I want to go back to the question I promised that I discussed with, uh, with NAV. So I'm going to scroll up quite a bit. Um, woo, man, you guys have fun. Okay. We're here. I'm almost there. I think I passed it. Oopsie. Okay, got it. Okay, so when it comes to when it comes to this difference in that there are no resilient systems, a, di a key difference is that there are no energy input into our materials versus uh, biological systems do. Okay, that's an inter it's interestingly phrased. So if we start doing that, uh, we will make process uh, progress towards this. Yes. Uh, fundamentally, the answer is yes. We need to start thinking of how we can get no net input. Okay, that is that is the key, right? Um, definitely, we need to start thinking at a molecular level how we can have or artificial systems start doing the same thing the body does, which is you know grab the energy from the environment and fixate it so they can do function, right? Do function, that sounds very broad. Okay, what I mean is um, to be able to perform better the function that we want of the system, right? Uh, and definitely we need to have it uh, to rethink our systems in such a micro and nano scale so that they can start having this quote unquote molecular bot or nanobot as they like to call it. This is some science fiction stuff. I don't believe it might be necessarily possible in that way. But we need to start thinking about how this, this tissue, this living systems are able to regulate and pick up from their environment materials to be able to perform functions. A, a great example, for example, is metal fixation in, uh, in chitosan exoskeletons for most bugs, right? So beetles and scorpions, etc., etc. they eat uh, metals, just ions, right? Basically, okay, um, let me finish that, that idea. So bugs, they sort of like reinforce the, their exoskeletons. Oh, that, oh, oh, that's so interesting. But as I was saying, um, what bugs do is they reinforce their exoskeletons with metal uh, atoms. And that is very important because think about it. If their claws and their shells were made exactly of the same material with exactly the same uh, moss scale resistance, the claws would break on impact upon the shells. But that is not what happens when one bug bites another bug. The reason is that the materials in the bug's claws and teeth are reinforced 
and so are the shells, right? So you have this constant competition to better reinforce and structure, you know, thinking more about the physical structure of the material, these shells and these teeth so they can sort of prey on each other. And that is a very interesting case of living beings sort of being able to have this rich chemistry and biology where they grab a, a unique resource from the environment and put it onto their structures, right? Um, what, how, not everyone's doing it and doing it wrong. I mean, <laughs> oh, that's a controversial topic, but going back to, to NAP, basically, long story short, there is no system for energy capturing or current materials. There must be some work uh, somewhere someone is trying to incorporate such things. Okay, to talk about, for example, uh, my field, one of the applications of supercapacitors is photo supercapacitors, right? So we're trying to make these microsystems that ha have like a hybrid um, perovskite electrode that can both capture uh, solar energy and use it to store it onto a supercapacitive structure, you know, just charge storage. And that is super cool because we can then integrate it. This is sort of like a micron structure thing. So we can integrate it into uh, robots, right? And this has been done previously. We have um, we have this tiny little robot that uses this uh, photosupercapacitor to power itself. And we have it running around uh, the lab and we want to do it in a drone too. So that is the level of engineering we're trying to accomplish, right? So be able to use energy first to move around, just harvest the energy from the sun to move around. This is what we already do. But eventually, we wanted to harness the energy to do self-repair, right? And that is how we start thinking about how we can bring these biological properties into energy in engineering systems. Let me go back to Festus question. So what do you think of using fibrin for collagen scaffolding? Uh, there's a degradation issue, but the derivatives in problem. I have not researched uh, the fibrin itself, I promise I'll get back to you. Degradation will always be an issue with biopolymers to a certain extent. But as Nav mentioned, you can do surface modification and general chemical modification to improve the durability of biopolymers. Um, it's interesting. I promise to research further. Let me just write it down. Well, I'll copy and paste it more like. Um, and I'll get back to you next lecture, okay? Oh, God. Okay, I want to start that one. Prox, can you not? Um, but definitely, right now we're just in questions. Like, um, for more specific questions, I'd love to, to answer them. But remember that we still have at least two more lectures coming up. One on materials chemistry, understanding how these things are assembled and why do they work the way they do. And the, ne and the next one's going to be uh, foreign body immune response. All right, so these are the two big lectures that are upcoming. Um, question. Actually, I have an example. Okay. Oh, it's more like commentary, right? For example, of material non-bio that improves itself from an input. There's a heat shield on the space shuttle that it's only initiated once. And the material starts to react. Okay, oof. Ah, uh, those are very fancy stuff. And I, I have heard of them. Um, there are materials. There's also, for example, uh, it's a nanotube composite that becomes stronger the more you punch it, right? Because sort of like uh, nanotubes diffuse into the material and reinforce the structure. So it is possible to have... It is very possible to have materials that imitate biological systems by improving their fitness as they are exposed to um, perturbations, right? So that is super cool, super awesome. And that is what we want. That is what we want. This is the next level of uh, biomaterial engineering. Relationship between now and actually, if you mentioned, oh God. Oh, 
I mean, machine learning is definitely an, an interesting tool. Uh, it's using mostly for discovery purposes at this point. Uh, alloy prediction properties and whatnot. It's good as a preliminary study, but as we know, like theoretical studies without proper experimental checkup are not the way to go, right? <laughs> Machine learning is indeed a nonlinear fancy regression, but it's a very useful nonlinear fancy regression. And we use it often for many applications, right? Uh, actually, th that is a very interesting point, right? We talked about biological systems versus engineer systems. We're at a point where for a specific task, not a multitude task, but, an, uh, but a, a specific task, an engineer system can improve weed operation, right? I have a bias it's because of my feel. I bet. But what is fascinating is that robots can improve at a given task, not through their aptitude, right? They don't become better at doing things. Uh, like their engines, I mean, their, you know, their pistons do not become able to bear more load or whatever. That is not what happens. But they do become better at executing tasks through trial and error. And that is very interesting. It's definitely very promising. But what I'm talking about is physical feature, right? What is fascinating about a, humans, uh, a human system, the human body, is that I can have a person, they have a limit, like how much they can lift in, I don't know, a deadlift. And if they do the deadlift, they take it to the max, the next week, the next month, they're going to be able to beat the max. Uh, the Atlas robot, I think it can lift something close to half a ton, right? It will never lift more than half a ton. Never, right? You would have to build another robot or replace parts, etc., etc. Bodies get better through their own complex processes. And that is, to me, it's what's so valuable, so important, so worth investigating about biological systems as an engineer. I want my systems to be able to do what the body does. And of course, there's a big limitation, as NAF says, hey, well, what about the energy consumption, et cetera, et cetera. The, the body is an incredibly complex system, right? And the point of this lecture systems, as a, lecture systems, lectures, as I told you, is to encourage you biologists to realize that this is your game. You're the guys who really get into understanding the biological systems. You know, the whole biomolecular mechanisms, the biochemistry. This is so, so very important, so very fascinating. And it's, it's, it has so many applicabilities outside of understanding biology itself. Because once we understand biology, we can try to replicate the features of the system, right? As we define biomaterials, um, okay, so we're gonna get um, Oh, a peg. Is there a particular reason it's mass? Is something special about it? Okay, so let's get a peg. Basically, let's, let's be simple. Okay, let, let me get an image. Uh, okay. Let me find it. There it is, that's the peg. No, 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 no. I need the molecule, peg, molecule. Okay. Okay. Um, okay, you see that structure, frogs? Imagine if the immune system reacted to such a basic structure that's used in sugars, it's just everywhere else, it's just like, like, the reason you can have the immune system attacking PEG, uh, polyethylene glycol, is that it will target pretty much everything else, right? Um, of course, there must be a more elaborate explanation. I won't say that. You can't have to vote against PEG. Wow, I'm shocked. I promise I'll, I'll go into more depth uh, in this. Woo! I'm now, NAV is bringing some crazy stuff. Generally speaking, what they will tell you in sort of Biomat uh, 101 grad school is that PEG is such a common uh, structure in the, like the, the monomers of the polymer are so common that most immune uh, systems for detection will not interact with it. Um, 
that's basically the quote unquote answer. But I promise I'll get back to you on that one to to go super deep into why PEG is generally left alone and to see how there are antibodies that actually attack uh, polyethylene glycol, which is kind of crazy to me, right? Like, I'm going to Google that stuff. Um, in countries. Yep. Apparently, <laughs> there are immune. Oh, God. That. Well, I learned something today. I'm, this is why you should give lectures. You learn all sorts of new stuff. Um, but definitely, we'll, we'll take a dive into this next lecture just to cover uh, the questions. So what I'm trying to think is for the structure, every new lecture will have the questions that I did not know the full answer to. And we will see um, the, the detailed answer. From there on, we'll go to the next lecture. For those who, that were not around, then just a reminder, next lecture is going to go hard on the chemistry. So if you thought NAB was talking too much, this lecture, just you wait for the next one. It's going to be basically NAB back and forth, me, all the time, because we want to talk about chemistry, and chemistry is beautiful. And on the third lecture is when we're going to try to go really deep into the immune, foreign body immune response, okay? Also, I am kidding. NAB is phenomenal. I thank him so much for the input. He always has the best comments and questions. Um, so definitely, I appreciate his input so much. Love you, man. Um, okay, so any other interesting questions, fun stuff you have? Um, questions about the next lecture? Maybe. Okay, uh, Kyle's question, next question, next session. Okay, uh, I'm going to look Kyle's question. I didn't see it. I uh, missed it. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, you mean like Captain, just the material? Sure. So I don't recognize the name right at the get-go. Probably it's a common by material that I don't use. Um, oh, that, Paul. Oh, that's... Yep. So this is the polymid stuff. Fascinating. This looks very cool. I'll look into it later. Okay, so uh, biomaterials have been studied in the developmental stages of an organism. This may sound outlandish, sounds like naive, I have no, but, but consider the brain instance. Okay, yes. Uh, nanomaterials have been studied as uh, for the developmental stages of an organism. It's part of their, toxi their toxicity assay, right? Um, Basically, there's a huge concern that certain things are only toxic in the developmental stages of both humans and, um, you know, animals, generally speaking. So there are specific studies that you do to evaluate if a biomaterial is um, toxic to a creature in their development, you know, embryonic, et cetera, et cetera, stage, right? Um, for example, this is not a biomaterial, but sort of like a, an important outline. Ooh, all co-workers doing biomaterials for fetal encephalitis. So that's a great example. Thanks, Kraken, for, for the input. Um, but an example I was going to give you about how developmental toxicity is super important. Lead is the classic example, right? So on adults, lead is bad. But it's not nearly as bad as it is for children because it impairs a brain function development. So people who are exposed to high quantities of lead in water as they grow up will have uh, brain development problems and reduce intelligence, etc., 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 right? So... It's something that we have to consider very carefully that materials have different toxicities for organisms in development than fully developed organisms. And there are lots of studies, standardized studies, to test for this toxicity. Yeah, imagine putting lead hips <laughs> never, right? Uh, but this is this is important, right? 
uh, because a lot of materials are super interesting, have incredible properties, but we could never, ever, ever hope to put them in the body because they would leach, uh, especially with metals, right? So you have incredible metals, but they will drop ions into the body and those would have a certain toxicity. Um, most of the metals that are used in the body have what we call a passivation layer. We will go into that next lecture. But what happens is that the body doesn't actually react with a metal. It reacts with the oxide layer that forms on top of the metal. And that protects the metal from being degraded and sort of like releasing ions into the body. Oxide layer. Just a quote-unquote rust layer, I guess. Um, but it's, for example, titanium ox Titanium is like the, the biomaterial because it forms, okay, hold on a second. Is this referring to bulk element metals? Okay, metal organic frameworks, ooh, that's a good one. Uh, let me just uh, reemphasize before I go into that one. Metals uh, form oxide layers. Metals like aluminum, metals like uh, titanium form very tight, very structured oxide layers that are very possible to stream. Um, I mean, we're answering relevant questions, so, so no problem there. I think we can keep streaming for a bit. Um, so that oxide layer keeps everything passivated. And then NAB asks the question, this is referring to bulk uh, elemental metals. What happens with metal organic frameworks or other similar structures? Uh, standard metal organic frameworks, the ones that are used for gas absorption, like MOF-5, uh, they are not biologically compatible at all. They'll be easily degraded, right? They're not even stable with humidity. And they will leach metals into the body if allowed, right? Now, those are sort of like the first generation metal organic frameworks, MOFs, as, as Nap said. But currently, we're developing the next generation of metal organic frameworks, which I imagine this sort of, um, they're this ligand to metal crystal structures that have this fascinating high surface area properties that are tunable. They're still a little bit too sensitive to, bo to body chemistry, so we can't use them in bodies. But as Nap said, we're making strides into using metal organic frameworks in the body. The, new, the next generation of metal organic frameworks are water resistant. So um, it's definitely a promising field. After the next two basic lectures, you know, basic science lectures, I do want to endeavor to talk more about specific. Uh, bye, Craft. Thank you for showing up. Oof. Uh, carbon organic frameworks are also very fun. Very fun. Uh, very interesting. And, and CMOFs. That just sounds cool. I, I do find those, those are very interesting. We definitely can go in deep about those. I will probably try to make a passing mention about them next lecture. But we have advanced materials, right? Guys, we have the basic ass materials and we have the future material. And metal organic frameworks are clearly on the future. Okay, so I guess we had enough talking and back and forth. Um, you can ask um, Frox for specific... Uh, I mean, we have a schedule and everything. So I would probably talk with Frox to schedule the next lecture, but definitely very excited to have all you people show up. I love every single one of you, and I'm very glad to do this lecture series so we can keep on discussing all the beautiful things about materials. Uh, do let me know, probably by DM or whatever, if this lecture length is appropriate for you. Would you like to go longer or shorter? That would be very valuable for me. Like, I try to keep it short and sweet and make a big discussion, but um, you tell me how you like it, and I'll adapt to that. 